Welcome to RoboHub. Um, I'm Abate. I'm the co-founder of Fluid Dev. And today I have with me Brandon Gila, CEO of Lexanis, maker of the Oak D line of cameras. And super excited to have you on here. Yeah, th thanks for having me. Awesome. So before we dive into Luxanis too deeply, um, tell us a little bit about your your background. What was your journey like in your career, in your life? Yeah, so um, it's a great question. Uh, Elon Musk is, is probably like retroactively like my hero in terms of like doing engineering things. I just realized on this call <laughs> that um, going into engineering, so I, I did an electrical engineering undergrad and master's. Um, I really just wanted to learn how the world works and specifically how things like modern human existence was made um, and how to, to like further that craft of just being able to build all the amazing things that can be built in the world. And so I just wanted to learn like engineering, which um, was like a naive, like probably childish view of like <laughs> the possibilities of what you can cram into a human brain. And so going into college, I was like, what do you mean you have to like only do one of them? You have to do like electrical or mechanical or civil or, uh, you know, go into physics or something like that, which physics is probably the closest to like learning them all. Um, and so electrical seemed like the one where then I could secretly do all of them. <laughs> so mm -hmm. like, cause it felt like it touched like nearly everything, especially if you, at least I went to the university of Colorado, which was heavy on, um, teaching software engineering and firmware engineering as part of the electrical engineering program. And so, and that touched like nearly everything. Um, so I, so I subdisciplined there, but then in electrical engineering, I already viewed that I had like made a compromise by having to get into electrical engineering. Um, and then once I got into electrical engineering, they were like, well, now you need to subdiscipline again. <laughs> like, are you going to be like radio frequency analog IC design. And I was like, what's that? And they're like, well, you need to pick one. You can't just be an electrical engineer. And so um, largely with the help of my advisor, I was able to say no to that. Um, and so I, I did about everything that, that I possibly could in, in terms of trying to learn all the things that you could do as an electrical engineer. Um, so did aerospace engineering, did wireless charging. Uh, one of my mentors got time intervention of the year in 2007 for wireless charging. And I was graced with the opportunity to work, work under him. Um, so I said, aerospace, wireless charging, uh, did nitty gritty power electronics, did, uh, radio frequency electronics, even, even took that analog IC design course that I talked about and the radio frequency equivalent of it. Um, and, uh, yeah, just, just tried to do as much as I could in electrical engineering. And then through my career, I kind of viewed the same thing where I just wanted to be able to touch like anything and everything. Um, and I remember actually when I was explaining why I chose electrical engineering, I was like, well, if I want to work for a formula one team at some point, I feel like, um, and actually one, one of the engineers here competed in the Indy autonomous grand challenge, <laughs> which, oh, nice. which kind of fits it's Indy, not formula one. But I was like, I feel like electrical engineering is my highest probability that, that I would actually be able to be involved with that, um, with all the things I'm interested in. So that's my background, electrical engineering, but just all over the place. Um, and I saw an opportunity to, to get into AI and computer vision after one of my mentors actually hard switched from um, uh, networking equipment. So like switches, routers, Wi-Fi access point, outdoor long, long distance stuff. He, he told me AI was going to be the biggest opportunity of his career. Uh, and I had no idea what AI was. <laughs> and so I, so I switched industries again to get into computer vision and AI. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's very interesting. And I think this is the path that a lot of people in robotics take as well. You know, I think I, I was faced with the same crossroads and I decided to do mechanical engineering because that felt like, you know, you get your, your foot in a lot of doors um, and then graduated and then realized that, you know, there's more that I wanted to do than what was taught in school which yeah. is where robotics um, and robotics being the, you have your foot in every um, corner um, of the engineering space. So that, that's definitely what called out to me. And I think a lot of other uh, roboticists out there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's it's extremely multidisciplinary and that's why robotics is super cool. I think it was Kat at uh, Open Robotics. I asked her why, why she was into robotics, why she does what she does, like what got her into it. She was like, well, it's, it's just the coolest job you can have. <laughs> She's mm -hmm. like, there's just not a cooler job than robotics. And I was like, that's a good point. And, and then part of her answer is because it is so multidisciplinary. You've got computer vision, you've got physics, you've got route planning, you've got mechanical engineering, you've got mechatronics, you've got 
org design, you've got power design, you've got system engineering. In some cases, you also have aerospace because <laughs> you're sending some robotic system up into space. Yeah. And um, so, you know, you graduated with your um, electrical engineering degree, and then you went off and you worked in um, switches and networking equipment. Um, I know that you did some some work at uh, Ubiquity. That's um, right. And yeah, and then you had this mentor who who told you about machine learning AI. What was that experience like? Yeah, so um, yeah, I was, I was working at Ubiquity, huge fan of the company, uh, still a huge fan of the company. Um, you know, my whole career path is enabled uh, because of Ubiquity and the, the fine folks there. And uh, uh, w- one of the many there, so, so Robert, the owner, you know, oh, a huge thanks to, and then uh, Robert Para, and then John Sanford, uh, who'd, who'd worked with Robert Para for a long time, was another one of those mentors, and then Ben, ben Moore was another. Um, and John Sanford, um, he was the CTO there, uh, and things were going great. <laughs> and there's an expression actually that Robert, the owner, taught me, which is winning cures all. So like in these companies <laughs> where you have like in, infighting or, or you know one person hates someone else, like if you can just fix the problem of not winning, um, then like people will all just be happy. Like once it's, once you're winning, that just all those problems go away. And when, when you're not winning, that's when all those problems come up and we were winning and like winning really big, <laughs> like it just like where it's like the winning cures all for sure. Like we had hit the winning cures all threshold and then like pole vaulted way past that. And, um, and John Sanford resigned, uh, the CTO resigned and I was like, what, like, what does this mean? And so I really. Uh, like really like interviewed him on it. And, and ultimately he flew out to Colorado because I asked him so many questions just so we could like sit down together for like a day and discuss it. And, you know, the, the TLDR was, he was leaving because he viewed AI as the biggest opportunity of, of his whole career. Um, and he didn't have like a little career. Um, he, you know, had, had founded multiple companies that had gone to hundred million dollar plus valuation and sales. And he had, personally done all of that. He had, he had mentored who became the youngest billionaire in the world, right? Directly mm-hmm. helping to scale that company to a multi-billion dollar company. Um, and those were just the things I knew about, right? Uh, and had this huge impact on, on all sorts of design things worldwide. And his tools were used by all sorts of engineering companies behind the scenes. And so him saying that this, the AI was the biggest opportunity of his career really like landed hard on me and hence why he had like volunteered to fly out to meet with me. And um, the only thing I knew about AI before that was that it was useless. Um, so as my, my roommate, actually, Albert Wu in college, was taking a course in AI in 2004. And he came over and I was, asked him, I was like, AI, what's that about? And he's like, it's useless. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah, like I'm programming Lisp. You can't do anything. And this is just like research. Like, and I don't know if he used the term AI winter. He probably didn't. But it really like solidified the idea that we were in an AI winter. Um, and... And so that was like my last mental model of AI was useless. And then John Sanford uh, resigned and we had that whole conversation. And, and then what talk, year talk. was that? That was in, I think, 2016, I, I believe. Mm-hmm. And um, so late 2016. And uh, so then that just like kind of burst that bubble. And, and he told me about like, you know, deep, deep neural networks and machine learning and all these advances and, and the computation being possible. And, and one of the things that, that John had spearheaded in his career is he actually used clusters of um, like hundreds of computers in, in uh, uh, what is it, genetic algorithms. So it's like evolutionary antenna design effectively, where it like self experiments. So it was already in the direction of AI and that's what pulled him into this. And so he explained all that to me and I was like, oh, holy cow. And so I started researching and digging into it more and more and more. And just kind of like the, the whole cell phone boom, like the whole app store boom, kind of like came and passed when I worked on like nitty gritty RF engineering stuff and in like five years had passed. And I'm like, that would have been a good idea to get into. Um, <laughs> I learned about AI in like 2016 and I was like, okay, so 2012 was really the year to get into this. <laughs> like I missed by four plus years again, maybe five years to do this. Um, but anyway, it got, got all my wheels spinning on and my, my mind churning on all the potential here. Um, and that was really like the seed for all of this and, and the core reason that I, I didn't continue working at Ubiquity because because I, I loved working there. Yeah, yeah, you definitely always feel in the moment like, oh, you know, a little bit late to the show. There's already a lot of players that are already in here. Um, and then it's only really in retrospect years later that, you know, it's like 
it was still a good idea to just jump in um, head first back in 2016. Yeah, and, and specifically, so I, I didn't jump into this, but um, what had happened is in cloud um, starting in 2012, so all these companies like that laid the groundwork and, and were acquired to form Siri and Cortana and Alexa and all of those we're all cloud-based, right? And, and all those mm-hmm. services still are fundamentally cloud-based, except for like the wake words effectively. Um, and so cloud, it just felt like, whoa, missed that whole boat. But then edge was still relatively new. Maybe I was like a couple years late, but then in embedded, which is, oh, that was the other thing in college, um, embedded systems was like a core focus of mine. Um, so I uh, was the teacher's assistant. That's how I paid for grad school as I was the teacher's assistant for the embedded systems design class. Um, embedded was like near and dear to my heart. A lot of things that I did, whether it was RF or space or what have you all involved some embedded system. It seemed like it was largely uh, only like one player and only covering like one niche, um, which actually was open in the, um, with a mm-hmm. um, who's, who's well known in the industry and, and his niche is, you know, embedded AI and CV. Um, and, and I think it's like the go-to platform, uh, Arduino is partnered with, with open MV. And so I saw like, okay, well, cloud, I'm like really late. Everyone's already sold their companies to Apple and Google and Microsoft and so forth. Uh, Edge, it seems like there's an opportunity. And that's what I initially pursued. And then uh, with embedded, uh, like actually being able to have an embedded product that does all that, like a little little depth camera or a, or a system on module you can put in some tiny standalone thing. It felt like the market was actually wide open. Um, and so started in Edge and then moved, moved more into just purely embedded. Um, where, where it was was really early in the market. And actually the concern was like, is it too early? <laughs> so it, it kind of flipped on its head. So so I would caution actually folks that, you know, the most important thing is team, um, but but timing's, timing's really important too. And I, I would say though on that, like maybe four years being late, I have since seen companies go nearly purely into cloud in that time, starting about the same time that Luxonis did and just totally dominate the market, like $100, $100 million dollar, uh, market cap companies. So I think, I think my initial read probably wasn't wrong, but I was a little terrified to, to step into something where potentially we'd be competing with folks that have like a, a four year advantage, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's definitely very intimidating. Um, and so with Luxonis, you're, you're taking over this to the edge and machine learning, computer vision, and all of these things on device. Um, can you walk us through what your company's offering? Um, and then how this stands out from what is already there in legacy in the market? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great question. So um, the, the, the story behind founding the company is I, I saw that there's all these like use cases. If, if you could use this on the edge or if you can embed it. Um, and so the first thing uh, that I went after and what I actually intended to found as a company was I... I I love looking at things as like basis functions, like, you know, in math, like the basis function on which you can build all sorts of things. And in technology, like new basis functions arise, and then you can build new things because you have those basis functions. And so like the thing that I sought to build, which then this flows in, hopefully it isn't too circuitous of an answer, but flows into our product offering is, um, I saw like, I've always liked laser tag, even from like a kid and growing up to then be an electrical engineer, I was like, oh, cool. So like the new basis function that gave, like caused laser tag to exist was like laser diodes, right? And like mm-hmm. uh, uh, photo sensors and, and so forth. And an electrical engineer is like, I can make a game out of this. Um, and so I viewed like a new set of basis functions with all this like edge AI, computer vision, spatial sensing, high resolution, uh, simultaneous lo- localization and mapping and so forth as a new set of basis functions. And I was like, all right, well, some clever person in like the 1980s saw laser diodes and was like, that's a basis function to make a cool game. I saw those things, spatial sensing, AI and and so forth as maybe a new basis function to make like a real life action sport video game playing. So like imagine Halo, but like the best Halo player is is really good, not just because he's smart and clever, but because he can sprint faster than other people. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's actually what looks like I personally started um, and was is wanting to build is like a real life laser tag with a virtual reality. So like you're in a physical space with physical walls and they're augmented real time, both you and, and the other players. So you're playing physical people, you're sprinting around 
And um, so I was working on like edge spatial AI stuff. And when it's trying to recruit game developers and to make this whole virtual experience. So you could have this like very social, very like athletic, like a new sport effectively um, that was virtual reality. Uh, and what ended up happening is when I was trying to recruit top tech talent around here in Colorado, very stereotypical to Colorado, um, we, uh, when, I, when I met up with folks, uh, there, was, there was tragic news about kind of a stereotypical Colorado thing, which is like we ride bikes everywhere um, mm -hmm. and, and like to just like bike commute, free exercise and so forth. And so um, four folks in my circle it turned out had been uh, hit by distracted drivers um, while they were just riding their bicycles. Not bad people, just people that looked down at their phone at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. And like my business partner had like hit a street sign once doing the same thing. And he's just lucky he was a street sign, not a not mm -hmm. person. And he keeps his mirror all mangled for that reason. So um, when I found out about that, so one was killed just by a mirror. So someone just drifted out of their lane enough to clip clip the person and kill them. It was the, the founder of a hacker space near me. Uh, one got a traumatic brain injury and then two were bedridden for months, with broken back femurs and shattered hips. I kind of felt like my modern version of laser tag was really dumb after that. <laughs> and so, yeah. so I hard pivoted the business, but already, if you think about that, it was, it was kind of about robotic perception, like what you'd need for a robotic perception system. Cause you need to know where things are, what they're doing. It has like strong corollaries with machine guarding, but it was more edge based. Um, so I, I hard pivoted myself. I actually had two co-founders at the time and, and I was like, let's just hard pivot. And they were like, nope. <laughs> and so they stayed in their direction and I started a new business, Luxonis. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was all about seeing if we could solve that problem, which brought us down this technical direction of moving. You know, we talked about cloud to then edge is where I was working. Cause on that, like, laser tag system like you could have like the equivalent of like four macbooks on you you know you, you play for mm -hmm. like five or ten minutes you can have a macbook on your chest macbook on your back and like the equivalent of one on your head and maybe like additional processing and like arm guards and stuff right so it was very edge like you can put macbooks at it in this uh safety thing the safety solution trying to protect people who are you know both the driver who accidentally clips and kills someone because they're text messaging and the person who's on the bike who gets killed uh, it, that required it to be an embedded system um, mm -hmm. that had all those capabilities, spatial sensing, uh, high resolution, high frame rate, multi-sensor, um, uh, depth sensing so that you can know like where a vehicle is and in physical space where it's trajectory, AI, so you know it's a vehicle and not just like, you know, another gaggle of bikers or something that pose no risk, right? Uh, and then CD because you need to tie it all together. So it brought what I was already working on, very similar, what things are, where they are in physical world in real time. So you can augment the world to from edge where it's a lot easier to an embedded system, where it's a lot harder. Um, and I was mm -hmm. curious if we were at that point yet. Um, so I went to a bunch of conferences, um, I actually got to talk to the CTO of Waymo at one. I was like that dude who like obsessively goes first to the stage to try to talk to him. And, and everyone was like, yeah, I think that's probably possible now about, you know, like, I think you yeah. can do that. Maybe it's, you know, size, weight and power is going to be a concern. Movidius had just come out, um, which was this network on chip architecture. It was the first chipset in the world that allowed you to take this like four MacBook level thing and put it in an embedded system. So it had, you know, um, uh -huh. uh, it just, could be in a, yeah. What is network on chip exactly? Let's unpack that, that term a bit. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question. So um, in the networking world, network on chip is the terminology because you're already coming from networking. But what happened is you have you, the, the whole industry went from uh, being like CPU based where, where you have like a thousand watt TDP system, total dissipated power is TDP. And, and you just go with a faster processor to solve your routing or switching or Wi-Fi problems as like the host of the Wi-Fi um, and some network or some chip architects looked at it and said, well, you're sure doing a lot of the same functions. What if we actually just baked those into silicon for all those specific functions? Instead of having a really fast CPU, you have all these disparate hardware blocks that perform the functions that you would be running on a CPU. And you just have a little CPU that just coordinates those. Mm -hmm. and so Ubiquity, that was like the, the core technical insight that allowed Ubiquity to do so well is Ubiquity was a software company primarily 
that made it so these uh, network on chip architectures that took, say, a, a total dissipated power of 1,000 watts for a given performance down to 5 watts. The challenge with network on chips is instead of one CPU, and you got to learn the instruction set for one CPU, there's 38 architectures. And so you have to have a software team that's capable of learning those 38 architectures because they're all different chip architectures literally from the ground up designed for a specific task. And so you have to learn those and get them to be coordinated. The advantage is if you can solve that software problem, go from 1,000 watts and relatively comparatively high latency uh, and high cost to 5 mm -hmm. watts, low cost. And so you see that with like, that's why Unify access points and edge routers and all those were able to vastly outperform these custom built uh, CPU systems because they were the network on chip. And the reason network on chip has fallen apart traditionally in the industry is that lack of software. Um, so that's that's the core problem. Um, and, and software is the hard part because you're just having to write across all these disparate architectures and you usually have these really high speed caches that connect the disparate hardware architectures so you can build these pipelines. In that case of networking functions, routing and packet filtering and deep packet inspection and you know access point functions and TDMA and all that. And then in um, the computer vision world, having come from that and seen that like just dominate the industry, like everything mm -hmm. uses that now. Um, to the computer vision world and Movidius uh, was one of, of actually several that were early on seeing that, hey, like packet switching, routing, access points, how those have dedicated functions that are always running. Computer vision is actually even more well suited for that <laughs> because you have things that you just know you're always going to want, like warp and dewarp and feature extraction and, and vectorized processing and uh, you know neural inf inference acceleration and all of these things um, uh, that, that go together on, on robotic perception systems. And so Movidius was was the first to maybe not to see that, but they were first to execute well on it. Um, in computer vision space. So there are other startups around the world um, that were doing this. Movidius was a startup that then was acquired by Intel, but a lot of them ended up in this Sophie's Choice area where it's like, okay, we got like our AI engine working and now USB 3.0 doesn't work. <laughs> and they're like, we fixed USB 3.0 and now feature extraction doesn't work. And so like, and the key with these chips is, is that basis function thing. You need, you need it to run as an embedded system. You need it uh, so it can be standalone and perform these functions and offload your robotic perception. You need high resolution, high frame rate. You, you need spatial sensing for, for robotics. You need AI and you need the computer vision. And so all these other competitors had these like Sophie's Choice where you like delete one and you're like, well, it's mm -hmm. kind of useless without AI, right? Mm -hmm. Or like on the computer vision, it's like, you're, wait, your video encoder doesn't work? Um, and so that's why we chose Movidius as they were the first one to execute with all of the core things that, that we viewed were needed to solve this safety problem, which then was is fundamentally a robotic vision problem um, because it had all the things that a robot needs. And in fact, the solution to that safety problem is a, just a robot. It's a little robot that tells when you're at risk and can honk a car horn or vibrate your seat post or make a notification or, or you know, make super bright LEDs flash that otherwise you wouldn't be able to flash all the time because you'd run out of battery in like five minutes. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's a robotic actuation problem specifically. And so we saw that this chipset existed, um, but there, there wasn't a platform yet for it. It's, it's really tricky to build platforms for these network on chip architectures. Um, mm -hmm. And we had seen in tech history, a lot of network on chip architectures just fail because no software platform was adequately written for them. And so it's a really long answer and I apologize, but the, the, the core of what we do is then the software that, that makes it so you can take advantage of going from like this thousand watt TDP system to a complete robotic perception thing where, where you can just define the pipeline that, that you want to run. Uh, so mm -hmm. an open source example that um, a hobbyist in France built using this pipeline he uses our IoT series, which, which runs completely standalone. It's, it's this one. Um, and it, uh, it, it runs pipelines of, of depth processing and AI and computer vision so that you know, it'll find him where he is anywhere in his house based on a person detector. Once it finds him, it runs all on camera, it runs skeletal pose um, so they can figure out where his hands are, um, even when they're far away where a hand detector normally wouldn't be able to pick them up. And then he uses, you know, the guide of like where the wrist ends 
uh, to feed that area into a, a polymer and dorsal detector, which is kind of a short range polymer and dorsal detector. And because he's using that approach, you can see it up to like, I think it's like eight meters or something. So really far away. And from there, he does full skeletal hand pose. And since we have a 12 megapixel camera on the standard models, um, he actually gets really high resolution of the hand. Um, so he can do a full 3D hand pose. And from there, he passes it into American Sign Language character recognition. Mm -hmm. So now he has, where are his hands? What uh, American Sign Language character, like, you know, basic, like one, two, three, four, five sort of thing, or like thumbs up or what have you anywhere in his house. So now he just never has to have a remote for anything <laughs> for his lights. Um, so it's, it's that same sort of robotic perception where they do machine guarding. And that's the core of what we build. We build the hardware, of course, so folks can just buy a camera and bolt it to something. And there's, we've got USB 3, 10 gigabit per second. We've got power over ethernet with IP67 sealed. We've got power over ethernet with like M12 X coded and, and hardware sync output. So we build all the hardware layers. We abstract there. And we have system on modules um, so folks can can quickly customize. And, and a lot of this, I think all of it actually has open source reference design. So if you like this and you're like, I need different field of view or different number of cameras, a different form factor, it's built on a system on module. So you can go build your own custom thing. But most importantly, the firmware, software, AI training and simulation, and then cloud deployment, management, and insight is where mm -hmm. we add the most, most value. So folks don't have to go reinvent that wheel when they're building a robotic system because we did <laughs> we saw that yeah. there was no platform like this if you needed all of those and so we saw a huge opportunity to allow folks in all these disparate robotics automation or robotics industries uh, to not have to redo all this work um, and and we love building platforms <laughs> so we yeah. saw it as, as a huge opportunity yeah, you can see that, you know, when you're when you're deciding to build a robotic platform and then you have multiple different pieces and sensors and all of these things that you're trying to pull together and then um, write all of their own um, software packages for each. And then what you end up at the end of the day is something that uh, consumes a lot of battery power. And then that right there can be a stopper to um, a lot of robotics projects that you want to make commercial. Um, yeah, so yeah. seeing something that goes from a thousand watts down to you said five watts, that's that's now even a USB can power much more than five watts. Yeah. Um so that that definitely is something that enables robotics. Um so you know, you mentioned a lot of different product offerings that your company is selling. Um why what was the reasoning behind going with multiple different hardware platforms? Um and then what are your what are the main sellers um, from these product offerings? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, you know, we are pretty new to the market and the whole market's new, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, ten, 10 years ago, a lot of the robotics problems that you can now like, that are now just like standard engineering problems were kind of like science fiction 10 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's like, everyone's discovering a lot of things and we're all kind of discovering together, like, hey, there's all these robotic perception tasks that we keep having to solve in all of our disparate industries, you know, whether, whether you're, you know, working on like a tennis court cleaning robot, or you're working on a warehousing robot or a grocery store robot, or, you know, a fish counting robot. Um, and so there's just a lot of learning. Um, and, and we believe that our customers are, are the best folks to design our products. So, so we've architected everything to be able to iterate fast. Uh, and to be able to like not, you know, spend a bunch of time thinking that we're geniuses that we can make like the best product for the market, but instead, how do we make it so we can just build products and, and kind of see what fits and what doesn't and, and how we move forward and what we double down on. And so we, before we actually had anything done, we just reached out to all the smart people we could and asked them, you know, what they need and what their pain points are. And so like, the number one voted thing by, by people who weren't paying for something, but just throwing an opinion in was, was this thing, which is actually a hat for a Raspberry Pi. And this was like by far, like maybe 90% of people said like, that's what you should build. That's going to be your killer product. So we made that. Um, but before we made it, uh, we, we got all sorts of other feedback. This is what I thought was going to be like the killer product, which was to integrate a Raspberry Pi compute module in the back and, and have all of the things I talked about. So you literally just provide power and it boots up doing all the things, right? Uh, depth sensing, object detection, 
you know, you just plug a monitor in it or a little touch screen. I thought this thing was going to be the hit. And then Quagga yeah. at OpenMB, who's an official advisor, he was like, nah, your OPD is going to be a hit. And it wasn't named OPD, but he described what is exactly this. And he was like, don't listen to everyone else, just build this. <laughs> and and so we got that feedback. Most of the market, 90% said to build the Pi Hat. I was convinced that the Raspberry Pi compute module one was the thing. And Guavana, uh, who was right, um, <laughs> said build the OPD. Um, yeah. And, and then so, the OPD, like, just describe what that is. Yeah. So so the OPD was, oh, why don't you have a triple camera that uh, just has USB power? Um, so it, it gives you depth perception and has 12, 12 megapixel color. Um, and so all of these would have like the same core functionality. They have 12 megapixel color. They have depth perception. It's just interfacing and form factor. The Pi mm-hmm. hat one just plugs onto a Pi. And so it gives all this robotic perception directly as a hat to a Pi with these like flexible flo- floppy flat cables, as I like to call them. So you like modularly put the cameras. This one, it's all integrated in just the one thing. And with the OPD, uh, and originally it was just a board, it's just a USB powered interface to it. So it's just a USB cable going to it. And so we had all these disparate pull where it was hard to tell who was right. Um, Quabana seemed like a super smart guy, inclined to like him. 90% of the market was saying to build this. And then my conviction is it was this the, is the thing that mattered. And that actually, uh, in, in combination with one of our first customers, made us realize that, well, the most important thing uh, would be to just be able to iterate and build things cheaply. So, so we mm-hmm. actually decided to not build any of those as our first product and build a system on module. Because uh, we said, well, this is probably going to be a problem generally for, for robotics. And, and already it's a problem for us. <laughs> what is the right form factor? Everyone's saying mm-hmm. different things. So we built the system on module so that we were able to make the Pi Hat in four hours. So it was four hours of design work based on the system on module. The Oak D design was only maybe like a day or two uh, to, to do the design uh, because all the complexities on the system on module. And then this was the most complex because we actually had to design a whole Raspberry Pi into it. So this was about a week. And so what that mm-hmm. allowed us to do is we spent the core amount in the system on module and then we can explore the trade space really efficiently. Um, so we don't have to make a big bet on who's actually right here. Turns out if we were just a bet, we should have just asked Quabana and, and done what he said. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just, to, just to, to dive in on that a little bit, you know, when, you, when you, 90% of your customers are asking for something and then you have a feeling and then, you know, one of your advisors has a feeling that they're wrong. Yeah. How do you go against that amount of data? Um, how do you go against what everybody else is saying and not just jump in and build a million uh, Raspberry Pi hats? Yeah, well, um, you, we didn't go against it. Large, largely what we saw, I, I love starting with like the why on things, like why, why do folks want things? And so one of the areas I think where we got lucky is um, we viewed this as okay, well, what the market really wants isn't any one of these. What the market wants is flexibility. Mm-hmm. Clearly, clearly, there's a lot of disparate demands. And we also got lucky there because one of our customers was just super smart. And so we were presenting this to them. And they wanted a fourth thing, which out of respect for their privacy, I won't say what it is. And so they came back to us and they're like, well, I mean, clearly you should just make a system on module, right? <laughs> like if you're getting all these disparate needs, like we need a system on module. Sounds like you could build all those products off as a system on module. And then and then even if those four that we're thinking about right now aren't the hit, you'll be able to explore into other products very quickly and easily, which which we did. Um, so then we made the, the Oak D, uh, which is the all included with an, um, there's, a, there's an ethernet interface in here. This is water sealed, it's IP67. And it uses that same system on module. So it allowed us to make that really quickly uh, and then we also made some IoT versions, which I was talking about that gentleman in France used. So we actually didn't go against the market. We just used the kind of the confusion we were getting from the market as a sign that that's how mm-hmm. we should architect things. We should architect it so you can move nimbly up at low cost um, with, with yeah. the help of just like an ecosystem of smart people that just took the data that we had and, and told us the smart thing to do. <laughs> Is this something that a lot of other companies are also um, using to build multiple different like hardware uh, platforms? 
Yeah. Um, and are there any like trade-offs, negative trade-offs that come from this approach as opposed to one singular fully integrated product? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, to jump to the second part of it. So we use the system on module approach and we made OPD that actually has, you know, the system on module right in the back here. Um, and, and we made the pie hat that, you know, the system on module literally like clips on, uh, if I can do it live, uh, clips on right here. Um, so in this, this uses the system on module. And then we made this Raspberry Pi compute module that has the system on module behind that black heat sink. And what we saw is that no one wanted these. We, d we don't end of life anything. So there's actually like a couple of customers who, who, who still buy these and will support them forever. And the system on module makes that easy. This, some people want it and they like it, but pretty much everyone wanted OPD. Um, and so, so we made, made our series two OPD that actually doesn't use a system on module. And as a result, it's, it's a bit smaller. So there is a trade mm -hmm. there on that flexibility. And we could have also with the system on module made this smaller. Not, not just that, but also cheaper, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's less expensive and, and more reliable to produce um, because it's a simple product. Um, you know, the system on module is really beneficial still when folks are integrating into a more complex product. The more complex the product, the more you want it to have a modular design. Because if you have some other single board computer, we have a lot of folks who use this as the front end of a perception system to like a Jetson Nano or a Xavier. Um, and so if like, they mess up their baseboard. They want to be able to, in like the yield isn't right. They want to be able to pop the Xavier module off and pop our module off just in production and test and use it on a different piece of hardware. But when it's just a more simple device, the there isn't a huge advantage to have system on module because um, uh, our yield is like a hundred percent now. So it's when it's mm -hmm. just a, a central central camera. So that's that is the trade. And so what we do now is we do all our first designs of a new product using the system on module. And then if that looks good and the market likes it, then we'll make a chip down design that we sell at volume. And what that serves is people who just want a smaller, less expensive, more uh, thermally efficient design. And they're just buying a standard product by this, uh, that's a chip down. And then folks who want to integrate into their more complex system, generally, they'll use the design files of that um, open source version based on the system on module. Um, so that's that's how the ecosystem works now. And then to your question on like trades, um, we then have a whole slew of cu customers. So like one half of the customers buy, you know, standard products like OakD Pro PoE, right? Um, mm -hmm. And bolt it to a robot in thousands to tens of thousands tend to be the volume. Then we have a whole different, and those can happen fast because you, you have robots, you uh, you, you replace maybe existing sensors or, or you're doing a whole new build of robots and you use these. Um, then we have a class of, uh, custom products that are built. Um, and, and that's like its own whole side of the business. And those take a lot longer. I call it like pie years, um, for those to actually be built. And those are just from the ground up built around, um, around our system on module. And then this is clutch because it allows them to like de-risk their design. And generally those also have other things in there. And that's where that, that modularity is, is really beneficial at production time. Yeah, no, de-risk is an excellent word because I think one of the greatest things about buying this product is that you, you're buying a piece of hardware, but on top of that hardware, you're getting access to a large database of um, different software packages for like the gesture detection, hand detection, um, and, you know, maybe you can dive in a little bit more into what all of those offerings are. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, like we talked about in terms of the functionality of the device, the thing that was missing in the market was being able to embed it, like it's small, low power, fast boot performance, so high resolution, high frame rate, multi-sensor, spatial sensing, onboard AI and CV. And that's the core of everything that we're focused on because we view that's what uh, robotics needs, right? And, and mm -hmm. when, when you're building a robotic system, you end up needing all of those all the time. There are other industries that also need those like automated sports filming, which I think that just comes down to like, it's a, what I call like a trapped robot. It's like, you know, you're maybe you're not physically actuating something because you're just spanning across multiple image sensors, but you're, you're replacing what, what you could otherwise architect is just like a full humanoid robot with a camera. Right. Um, yeah. so. So that's like the core of it. It's all that robotic perception. 
but there are layers and I view it as five layers of, of abstraction. So one is hardware, like finished camera products or a system on module. So you just get a leg up. You don't have to build all that. Right. Um, then the next is firmware. And that's where a ton of our work goes is making it so that you have this high performance system that's still abstracted to then the software layer where as a robotic engineer, instead of having to deal with that network on chip, which is really painful engineering or having to deal with the fact that you have this really high uh, thermal output system because it's less efficient than network on chip. We have um, a node and graph pipeline builder system that allows you to just describe, you know, like I, I talked about with um, gesture control, describe the, the graph of robotic perception that you want to do. Um, so in those are those things fight against each other, right? The abstraction while still being performant. So that's why we mm -hmm. spend a bunch of time there. And then on those examples, we have things for machine guarding. So like telling, you know, where are, where is someone away from a dangerous machine, like to protect the driver of a machine from hurting someone or protect the someone who might be walking it towards a wood chipper, right? Or walking into the stream of some dangerous material in an industrial setting or so forth uh, to tell where they are, where their hands are. There's a lot of like in examples for that. So we literally have one, you know, we didn't want to risk anyone's hands following an example. So we uh, set a Coca-Cola or a wine bottle as dangerous. And whenever your hand gets in like physical proximity of that, you know, in, in full physical space, proximity to that, it, you know, triggers a warning. Uh, I think, I think the warning that's printed is not 5 PM yet. Uh, but we have these across all sorts of industries, you know, whether it's machine guarding or it's, uh, you know, following, and we're going to have more examples even with, with Ross. So like, uh, robotic navigation, that whole stack running in, in full ground vehicle autonomy. Um, and I'm, I'm spacing. There's, there's so many, I think we have 250 different AI architectures that are converted and then somewhere about a hundred different examples that this span all across all sorts of industries, whether it's, um, you know, lossless zooming, which is that like trapped robot, where it's like, you discover where the action is, you run the image sensor at 12 megapixels, and then, uh, uh, zoom in, you know, and you get two megapixel output following the action in a sport, or similarly, you're trying to find some a feature on a product and automated QA or robotics where you're looking at the full 12 megapixel, you find the feature, AI guided mm -hmm. feature, and then you crop out of the 12 megapixel to get that information. And then you do like OCR off of it. For example, we have an OCR example doing that or for license plates. So there's this whole suite of, of examples that then you can base your thing off of. You're like, that's pretty close to like the feature that I'm yeah. looking for. And then above that, we have open source, uh, re retraining and training notebooks. Um, that, that you can use to then train for your specific application. And then as you get more serious with training, uh, we, we plug in very cleanly with RoboFlow, um, which who we recommend for doing like data set management. So when you move from like a prototype of just maybe using our open source scripts to train and you're like, you're starting to put your model into production and you say, okay, I need to figure out like, what is in my data set and, and how to balance it out, what other data to collect to really get my model to peak performance. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's at like kind of the AI level. Um, and then we help with simulation. We have plugins for Unity. Um, so you can simulate things, which can be extremely useful when you're architecting a robotic perception thing. Cause you just be like, well, what if I put a camera here or here and how does this neural network work on this data? And oh, I just generated a million images <laughs> to train my AI model so that while I'm still architecting my neural model or experimenting with my pipeline, I don't have to go late, pay, you know, $4 million to label a million images. You can just do mm -hmm. it overnight in unity and then get metrics for the whole performance. Um, so that's the, like, so that's where the Uni unity plugin plugs in. And then the next layer above that, which, which isn't out yet. So that's the fifth layer is cloud uh, insights and management of all of these. So, um, there's a ton of interest in strawberry picking, for example, as, as a robotic mm -hmm. problem and strawberry picking, I like to pick on it pun intended because, um, it's very visual on like what it's doing and then what the, what things can go wrong. So, uh, first you want to just identify an object detector, right? Where is each strawberry? Um, and then from there, uh, you want to run an image classifier or, or generally multiple image classifiers. Um, they will give you information of like, 
how ripe is it? Does it have mildew? Does it have some other defect? Is it the result of over or under watering or over or under nutrients or, or lack of things in the soil? And then based on that, you want to make a decision. Do I want to pick it is one of the first ones. And generally the answer is yes, I want to pick it. Uh, but some, maybe it's just not ripe enough. Um, and then once you've decided you want to pick it, then, then you want to pull out, say, a semantic map of the strawberry. So that's another thing that would run on camera uh, so that you can like soft grip it. Um, and then from there, you need to align that with depth so you can know where it is exactly in physical space and mm. where are the edges in physical space. So the interesting thing about that robotic pipeline, this perception pipeline, is you go from 7.5 gigabits per second of data that's coming in to like an OCD or a, a pro POE just from the sensor. And that perception pipeline that's running entirely on the camera takes that and produces two kilobytes of data, which is mm -hmm. where are all the strawberries? What do I do with the strawberries? And, uh, and if they're ripe enough, how do I zero cost sort them by ripeness? Because you can pick the strawberry and then a huge business value in strawberry picking is um, if, if it's very ripe, put it in a container of all very ripe. And that goes from like a, a farm to table, goes to a farm to table restaurant. So it's like, they're going to be perfectly ripe, right mm -hmm. when they're, you know, eating that night at dinner. If they're not quite that ripe, then put them in a different container and you're sorting as you're picking. So it's actually like practically zero cost. And that gets ships, shipped to Boston to go to a store shelf and it, it ripens on the way. So yeah. 7.5 gigabits per second to two kilobytes per second of what the robotic arm should do all on camera. That's yeah. amazing. That's massive. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really, really, really useful. But when you look at it from a scale perspective, and we're all about making this easy for robotic engineers, robotic perception engineers, which we view perception as the hard part of robotics, like the really hard part, you know, like Johnny Five and um, Short Circuit was was pretty cool mechatronics and in, in robotics motion. Um, if you think about all those stages, so you've got object detection, a bunch of image classifiers, uh, depth, depth sensing, semantic depth. Uh, oh, and an edge filter as well to get fine edges because the semantic might not be perfect. And if you do it with edges, then you can get a much better, like that's how Apple does their like bokeh effect, for example, it's AI with mm -hmm. edge filtering um, and depth, depth aware edge filtering. So you run all that and you get this two kilobytes per second. But when things go wrong, what the hell is going wrong, <laughs> right? You have all these different things in there that could be going wrong. And so the fifth layer are cloud uh, monitoring and deployment and A-B testing is all about having programmatic hooks because if something goes wrong and you need to record 7.5 gigabits per second of data to figure it out, you know the end goal of this is you want to have 100,000 of these strawberry pickers out there, right? 7.5 gigabits per second times 100,000 <laughs> strawberry pickers mm -hmm. times 20 cameras per strawberry picker is just all of the internet's data all of a sudden, right? It's just totally intractable. So the yeah. goal of the robot hub is to make it so that you can programmatically set at different stages insights and then data recording of what is going wrong so that then say if the depth confidence gets below a threshold or the ripeness confidence gets below a threshold on camera you can have this video encoding uh, that's happening all the time and then you just decide to no longer throw it away so you get lossless jpeg or mjpeg or h265 or h264 and then you can decide with robot hub when these conditions happen, the ripeness isn't right, or the disparity depth doesn't look right, or all of those things in the uh, ro robotic vision pipeline, then you can record. And that just saves mm. you tremendous. The encoding alone saves you a lot because that takes 7.5 gigabits per second down to like 75 megabits per second, right? Which is yeah. huge. But then the capability to only record when something's going wrong and based on these thresholds and choose to save to disk or put it up to the cloud directly to RoboFlow or uh, uh, pun intended, myriad other options is, is just so incredibly useful. So as we're seeing these customers go from prototype of like one to 10 to a hundred, we see that in then to hundreds of thousands, we see the biggest problem being these are really complex vision pipelines, which means when things go wrong, they're confusing because there's so many stages. And so having that insight in what's happening on the, uh, the engineering insight is extremely valuable, but then also just the business value insight. So I talked about pulling off like under or over watering or mildew or any of those, having a dashboard when you're the company making a strawberry picking robot, having a dashboard that shows the farmer, hey, you're watering too much here, <laughs> or hey, you have mildew on this whole section of the crop is extremely useful. We must think alike because this is 
uh, Robot Hub and then Robo Hub. <laughs> I'm, I'm on a Robo Hub podcast talking about Robot Hub. Um, so that's that's what we name it, and it's every we view everything as a robot. There are flying robots and swimming robots and running robots and driving robots and then trapped robots um, that are robots that have to solve all the perception problems, but but they're generally replacing some mechanical automation with mm-hmm. just observation that then uh, like autonomous checkout is a perfect example of that. You know, no, things no longer have to be moved by a robot that like beep scans things, right? It just allows you to all autonomously check out. So robot yeah. allows you to collect all that ground truth data, ship it off to say robo flow. <laughs> it's all about robotics to, to then retrain models. And then also allows you to have a B testing. Cause you've got this pipeline of say like 11 neural networks and all these computer vision functions. You change one thing, want to deploy it only to Ohio in the morning and have that run in Ohio in the morning to see if that actually solves the problem there. And then you can start to trickle AB test it out. Um, so that's, that's the thing that there's always been like our, or the thing that we've wanted to build, but it takes mm-hmm. a while to, you know, first was just building hardware, then firmware, then software, then the AI and simulation. And then in April we're releasing like the first like alpha version of that, of that robot hub that does all that. Yeah. Yeah, to give an anecdote from my own experience as well, you know, um, my so the first com- the first startup I joined um, out of college was actually this um, autonomous sports filming. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So we actually built one of these cameras. We did it out of like NVIDIA Jetson and uh, multiple camera stitching and then doing all of that on board and then uploading three 4K camera streams to the cloud and then um, doing all of the magic up there. Yeah. And one of the best decisions that we made was to take all of that work and then do it locally on device and just optimize the algorithms. Yeah. So now you're no longer sending, you're sending a fraction of the data that you used to be. And then this unlocks some massive things, especially in mobile hardware products, like being able to upload over LTE in a, in an affordable yeah. way. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, that several gigabit per second down to, um, getting the megabyte kilobyte per second range. Um, that's that's where you start unlocking value and being able to scale massively. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, so I think that's even... like to me the most exciting thing about the um, advancement and evolution of doing edge computing. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And even more so than say the the sports filming example, because on sports filming, maybe you're filming a game. Like if if you're really overzealous about it you'll have like five cameras, right? Um, and per like game that you're filming, but probably for a lot of the market, like one is enough or like two is enough. But in a lot of these robotics automation problems in a given site, you have 2000 cameras or 10,000 cameras. And then you're talking about like hundreds or thousands of sites ultimately as these roll out. And so the benefits, oh, and then also in the filming example, like a lot of times you want a live stream, right? In sports mm-hmm. filming, you want a live stream to be going. So like you get business value out of a compressed video going somewhere, right? And so you're okay with that cost. In a lot of these robotics cases, like ideally, you, you know, you want a situation where no data ever has to leave the platform, right? And so the the value add is even higher because in the, you know, the ideal end case, you know, uh, you know, the, with the geopolitical situation that's happening now, you know, none of us are paying attention to the robots anymore. Something awful and horrible is happening in the the robotic strawberry pickers, like Wally out there, just still picking strawberries, right? <laughs> and so that's that it, because there are so many of them. Um, and so yeah, in, in robotics, in so many industries, is it, it unlocks new applications to be able to do this on the edge. In robotics, it's just absolutely critical. It's like a another order of magnitude or multiple orders of magnitude higher value to, to have all this like embedded into the camera um, to, to unlock all these new robotics applications. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, so one thing that I've always been curious about with uh, with Lexanis, so you know, the software, the firmware that you guys write is of massive value and a big selling point of the product because you can just buy it, plug it in, do like all the things that you want to do and maybe you want to make it a little bit better or whatever it is for your specific product. Um, but you can instantly test now as your, as your customer base grows, and then say you've got like four store strawberry, um, picking companies using your platform, 
is there a type of network effect that happens where, um, you know, maybe there's some like contributions to open source um, software that's being written that's going to be more publicly available for everyone who buys the product. So after yeah. five years, the platform is better because of the larger customer base. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, and we're already seeing that a ton across industries. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really, really advantageous and especially in, in new markets like this, like maybe 10 years from now, you know, when, when like the way I look at it is like, there's, there's just all these disparate vacuums, right. Mm -hmm. Of like, you know, here's this vacuum of this whole huge industry. And there's like these tiny little startups <laughs> bouncing around in the vacuum. Right. And so in these each disparate markets, improvements and uh, robustness and testing and deployment ends up helping across all sorts of other verticals. So folks that are in filming, for example, have, have done IQ tuning and it's on our docs. Uh, IQ is image quality tuning. And, and mm. so there's an alternate image quality tuning uh, on our website that, that folks can use as a result and just even the robustness. So, so that's the goal. And that's a lot of the reason we have the business model that we do, which is um, we, the, the, I stole this from Ubiquity. So folks who are very familiar with Ubiquity and or investor <laughs> calls, I, I started out, they're a publicly traded company. So I started out as an investor at Ubiquity and then loved it so much and wanted to work there and, and did. Um, but on the investor calls, the owner would, would say, you know, we're, we're a software company that monetizes on hardware that really, that worked really well in the networking space because, because you were selling to engineers, you were selling to technical folks that, um, wanted to buy something and, you know, for $70 and like our OPD light on Kickstarter was $74. Um, and then just get the whole software experience without having to like, do I have to pay like 80 grand a year to like figure out whether this thing's useful? And so we have that exact same model, um, which is you, you buy the hardware. It's like that model taken in, and applied to this field. Um, in, in Wi-Fi and networking, you never really needed to build a custom product. You could cover all the needs of Wi-Fi and networking by just building standard products. And that's all you sell. So that's, that's what Ubiquity and Unify did. In robotics, um, you can cover a lot of the market with, with standard products. But when you get to these really scaled applications, you know, th maybe three cameras doesn't make sense anymore. You need nine, or maybe uh, you need two cameras and they need 2.3 megapixel because of the specifics and so forth. Um, so, so you end up in a situation where you need to customize. So that's why our, our business bifurcates between, you know, standard products and system on module so you can customize, but, but core to it is since we monetize on selling hardware, um, like when, when we build an open source, like this whole complex design is open sourced MIT licensed and MIT licensed for those who don't know, listening is, is kind of like, is it like Joseph Redman, like the do it the F you want license it literally <laughs> means like you can take the code, put it in closed source or open source or whatever you want. doesn't matter. Just run with the code. And so we literally then just bake our hardware in as, as it's just one of the components on the design, right? If it's a system on module or as just the camera. And so with that modality. It allows folks to buy this and not just have all the software for free, but have all the software be open source MIT licensed, which is just like as an engineer working for any company, that's so nice. <laughs> Whether you're working for a huge company, uh, because what it means is, is an engineer can buy this on a Friday, um, in it, take the whole code base, like the whole depth AI code base, um, integrate it into an existing huge monolith of a code base that's all proprietary show up to work on Monday and have someone in a meeting be like, wow, well, I'd like that, but, but then you'll never be able to integrate it in a code base and be able to say it's all integrated, right? Like it's already working with our whole software system. And the reason they can do that is it's MIT open source. And so for folks who, who literally can just take that's there's still value that comes back because they'll integrate it. And they'll put a GitHub issue of like, well, it crashes in this corner case that no one ever thought about. And then someone in another industry benefits from it. But in a lot of cases, and we've seen this, folks who see that MIT open source and they're like, ah, like, it's so nice. We'll literally just contribute back to the code base as well with fixes. Like, I think mm -hmm. uh, uh, Daya Bold, I think he's our like number one open source contributor. He, he probably does like five a day, like of like pretty major things that he's found. Um, it's just just the nature 
the nature of him, I think he's, he's a very um, detail oriented yeah. programmer. So yes, that's, that's the goal. And then what this allows the whole mission of the platform is allow it. So robotic engineers don't have to reinvent the wheel, but as this platform becomes the de facto, then it just becomes so much more of a no brainer because it's been so ruggedized across so many different use cases. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any projects that you're excited about up and coming? Yeah. So, um, we have a ton of them. Our whole, uh, series two Oak is, is like soft launching. Now we were wondering about doing, um, a Kickstarter, another Kickstarter. So we've done two Kickstarters so far. We did the first one was like all the Oak models. Um, so we did Oak D and Oak one and Oak D IOT 75 and Oak DPOE and Oak 1POE, talk about exploring the market, right? And so mm-hmm. I made the horrible car call of, of doing a Kickstarter that was five products, um, but it did well. We raised $1.5 million. And then um, one of the things we learned from that is that there are a lot of folks that don't need such high-end depth resolution. We learned that a lot of folks, they just want to know like, where is the hand generally? They don't need to like precisely map a room. Uh, so we made Oak D Lite, which was our lowest inversion. We sold for $74 on Kickstarter. And in parallel to working on that, we were working on our, so that's like a series one product. We were working on our series two, which is like a better version of Oak D POE and a better version of Oak D and so forth. Um, mm-hmm. And so this adds what is entirely missing in the Oak D ecosystem. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it on here, but it's mm-hmm. um, there's a laser dot projector. Um, yeah. So it's got a, a laser dot projector. And then um, also IR LED. So what this gives is is night vision, night computer vision. So you can do no light or super high con- contrast light where it's really bright in one area and would otherwise be dark in the other, enabled by this. And the laser dot projector gives you night depth. Um, mm-hmm. So RealSense, for example, gives you night depth, which, which is useful, but a lot of customers uh, have a hard time if they're navigating only having night depth, not night computer vision. Because mm-hmm. with depth information, great, like you can not run into things, but if you don't have feature tracking and uh, a, a feature extraction and tracking and so forth, you can't do localization and mapping, which means like you have no idea where the hell you are. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so in high contrast environments, robots or like in the, uh, what is it called? Like the kidnapped robot problem, the robot just has to wait for like human help when it runs into that environment. So that solves this problem. Uh, active stereo depth for for night depth and no light, no ambient light depth, and then blanket IR illumination. And those are interleavable, uh, so you can do them on even and odd frames. Uh, so you get depth information and feature tracking. Um, so these are coming out. It's actually eight different permutations. So there's USB, and this is M12 X coded power over Ethernet. Um, and these come either active or passive. That's one permutation that you can order. And also standard field of view, which is uh, like 70 degree horizontal, 85 degree diagonal or wide field of view, which is 127 degrees horizontal, 150 degrees diagonal. And so between those permutations, active or passive standard field of view or wide field of view, it's a, or USB or ethernet, it's actually eight, eight products. Uh, and we found that folks really just want all of those mm-hmm. <laughs> folks who are outdoors want passive because it performs best because IR illumination really doesn't mean anything in a lot of cases outdoors, except for some cases in agriculture where IR is wanted because they're pointed down and there's like really bright leaf. And then there's like a super shaded leaf underneath and IR uh, laser dot projection and IR blanket illumination helps. Uh, and then indoors, IR illumination is wanted. In some cases, folks want really wide field of view. So you can do a slam mapping. Other cases, folks want the narrow field of view because they're looking at a product on a production line for like QA inspection and so forth. Um, so those are the, those are the ones that are soft launching right now. And, and it's actually internally modular too. So you can, uh, replace the cameras. Uh, they have this modular thing. And so that's another thing is we support with our series two, uh, factory, uh, configurability options. Uh, so like if you wanted all of them to be global shutter or you wanted all of them to mm. be 12 megapixel or 13 megapixel, you can do that as like a factory order. And we've already had, even though these are soft launching now, we have them in our beta store. We've, we've actually already had several customers do orders of like 50 
Uh, we got an order for 70 of, of this one with a custom order, all global shutter today, actually. Um, yeah. So that's, uh, that's an exciting one. And then we're also the, uh, in addition to that launch, um, so those are all like available. Actually, you can just order those on our website in our beta store. So we do this like soaking stage. Then the robot hub launches in April, which I think will be huge. That's what takes us from like, you know, having to download GitHub, uh, like repository and like, you know, tippy tappy on the keyboard to get things running and just be like, Ooh, like follow me example. Yes, please. <laughs> or like mm -hmm. control all my lights example. Yes, please. Um, where folks can just demonstrate capabilities to themselves, to their boss, to their investors, like really quickly to show that, you know, this isn't just science fiction. And then they have the full source code of that and the capability to deploy it against across thousands or hundreds of thousands of devices so that then they can just modify it as needed and get all the insights out of it, all with a working example. So that's probably the most exciting one. Um, and then, so I talked about our series two. Um, we generally are, are working like multiple series in the future. So then later this year, we also have our series three. So where you take um, all of this, which does all the things <laughs> that I talked about, series three, um, also does all of that, but faster and better. And that, that'll mm -hmm. largely come out like end of 2022, early 2023. Uh, and it also adds a, a quad core 64-bit, um, a 1.5 gigahertz Linux system in there. Uh, and what that allows is for robotics applications that are either simple enough where, where that's enough of a host, you can literally mm -hmm. just build the whole robot off of it. Um, just the whole thing, right? Yeah. All the actuation, all the perception and so on. And then conversely for robotic applications that have a lot of complexity, say strawberry picking, um, you can then offload just a tremendous amount of perception all to the camera because you've got uh, more AI power, you've got faster depth sensing, you've got all these things and you have a quad core Linux system running Yocto. Um, and so that's exciting for both sides where it becomes the whole robot or where folks are like, man, like we really love all this, but it sure would be nice to just like, we've got all this open CD code that runs, uh, you know, in Linux. <laughs> like we'd, we'd love to just be able to run all that Linux stuff on the camera as well. So that's going to be coming Does that out. product have a name? Uh, it just, just series three, series three Oak. So it'll like mm -hmm. all the same permutations that you see here. Um, it's, it's based on, we just aligned our naming with, with Movidius. It happened to, to work out. So. So Gen 1 Oak or Series 1 Oak and Series 2 Oak are all uh, Gen 2 Movidius based. And then Series 3 Oak is, is Gen 3 Movidius based. Um, so yeah, that's that's end of the year. Uh, and the cool thing about that is uh, that has a Linux host built in. So Robot Hub will, will just tie directly into that with no other hardware being needed. Whereas oh, when, so. when you're running this, there would be some you know Linux system somewhere that Robot Hub would talk to, and this is talking to the Linux system, whether it's you know over Ethernet or over USB. With Series Three, it's it's all just you can all be directly to the camera if you want. Awesome, awesome! Thank you so much for coming on the the show and talking with us today. Yeah, absolutely. 